and um, welcome to another um, edition of um, the Space in Africa webinar. And this time around, this time around we're doing it with um, Jovio and um, Dunia. And um, today we are going to be, the webinar is going to be um, managed by um, Johannes Schmitz is the IT service and operations manager at Jovio, which is um, the main manager of the um, Dunia platform. And uh, like the title says, we're going to be, you know, gaining more insights on um, the importance of monitoring algae blooms um, in the sandbox using Python on the Dunia platform. Um, during this webinar, we're going to be learning how to access um, Earth observation data, Sentinel data, and how to use um, the features on the Dunia on the Dunia platform to monitor and you know facilitate healthy um, marine ecosystems in your localities. So, um, Johannes, please go on. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, let me quickly. I think I need to. Yeah. So, I thought of um, starting with a short Dunia um, presentation for those of you who have never heard of Dunia before or um, do not know too much about Dunia just for the first two minutes. Uh, for those of you who have already heard of this presentation you can yeah it's always good to have a repetition so i will quickly explain to you what dunia actually is so it is actually a project a project um started by isa um that geoville is mainly leading together with cs france from poland uh, from romania and from france as well as Cloud Faro as our data provider from Poland, and finally also the German Aerospace Research Center. Um, in the beginning, we thought of what African users would probably need so that we can improve the Earth observation community um, in Africa. So first of all, of course, you need um, a powerful infrastructure to work on. Everyone uses their laptop and their uh, mobile phones, but to actually create applications and work on, on Earth observation data, you would need an infrastructure. So our platform provides this infra infrastructure to the users. On top of that, we also um, offer the software uh, that you put on top of this infrastructure. So um, a capable tools, basically, um, GIS software, a sandbox. So everything you need to actually develop the data um, and the applications. So, and then if you have the, the starting environment, you have the infrastructure and you have the tools, you also need the data sets. So you, we actually offer all the Copernicus data sets from ESA and also other data sets over Africa um, so that we can actually dive right into uh, using this data and then creating our own applications, our own monitoring systems based on this data. Of course, we want to make it uh, easy to use. That's our main goal. And um, in case something is not as easy to use as we think it is, um, please, leave us a message. Um, this platform is tailored to African users. So when African users say this is not really easy usable, then of course we try to improve our system. We try to um, yeah, align this portal to our customer needs. And that's uh, our main goal. Our main goal is to um, bring earth observation data more into the African community and to um, teach people in Africa how to access the free available data sets um, over Africa. And that's why we give trainings and webinars and hackathons uh, such as this one. So um, to put it in a nutshell, Dunia is an all-in-one platform. So a platform where you can just with one click enter your private uh, working environment 
develop your own applications, access the data uh, for a region and a time frame that you actually are interested in, and then, you know, create whatever you want to create, uh, discover uh, the data sets, uh, build your own applications, and finally, uh, also share those data sets with others. And this is, uh, those are the three main uh, pillars of Dunia, discover, build, and exchange. So we want to let you um, discover the data sets by searching, filtering the data sets. Um, we want you to um, create your own applications by accessing your own working environment that is just accessible by yourself and scale up your processing if you want to actually process your um, application for a bigger area of interest. And then finally, you can share your results um, with friends, with the EO community in Africa by using um, our marketplace. So as I already said in Discover, you can select data sets, you can search filter for various data sets, download them, and also you can use our new streaming solution. By that, um, with use, using our streaming um, solution, you avoid having these tons of gigabytes per data set. And also you are faster downloading them because of a higher compression rate without actually using image quality. So even if you have a low bandwidth internet connection, um, you're quite fast in actually downloading Sentinel data. And that's a particular feature that is very interesting for Africa, but actually for the entire world because you save time and you save storage. Um, and this is, yeah, quite neat tools to, to actually stream satellite data. Um, yeah, then, as I said, you can build your application on top of that. For this, we provide a sandbox that I will dive deeper into today. Uh, that's here on the left side. So you have your own desktop and Jupyter development environment, but we also offer an application hub that lets you build your own workflows with a so-called workflow builder. And then you can just process um, an entire area of interest uh, with this workflow. So with few clicks, you can just process whatever you have already created. And finally, um, we want you, you know, we want that Dunia helps in improving the Earth observation community. And how do you do that? You do that with teamwork. So everyone needs to contribute to that. And this is why we offer a wiki where you see some documentation of Dunia. In the future, we also want you to um, contribute to that wiki. Also, we offer a marketplace so you can actually share um, your applications with others and, and use them. The, the applications of others as well. Same goes for data sets. So who is Dunia for? It's not just for experts, actually. It's also for beginners. So when you have no idea of, of Sentinel data sets, that's where you want to go. Like it's, it's great to go for Dunia if you have no idea. If you still have no idea after using Dunia, please, as I said, let us know. Uh, we actually want to help you diving right into using Earth observation data. Um, also, it's not just uh, for commercial use or project use, it's also for personal use. So if you're personally interested outside of university, outside of work, you're free to, to, to do so and use Dunia for that. So it's for all African users. It's basically made for you. And as I said, we are uh, we're depending on your feedback to improve Dunia day by day. So what are we going to do in the future? We will add more data sets. We will add more examples, such as the algal bloom example that I will talk about now. We will add more wiki content, more training events, and um, more functionalities in future as well. We will add more uh, bands and, and images to our streaming solution so that, yeah, Dunia will grow. And whenever you create something great, if you have a nice, uh, if you have created a nice data set, if you have created a nice uh, Jupyter notebook, please let us know. We're happy to publish your result at not just Dunia, but also ESA itself. So I think this pushes also your career 
if not just Dunia, but ESA itself is also um, sharing your success story on how you utilize Dunia. So um, go for it. Uh, we would be happy to hear from you. So now we will go to the dunia.isa.int together and yeah, discover, build and exchange together. So here you, we are on uh, dunia.isa.int. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, signed up again, it's quite easy. Just click on the top right sign up button and you have a small registration field uh, you just provide your name your your password some job description so that we you know can analyze where in uh, Africa you're from and from which kind of organization this helps us also tailor the service and uh, you also need to agree to the terms of conditions we are very um, eager in in uh, protecting your data so whatever data you upload uh, to your private Dunia working environment can only be seen by yourself. Uh, so Europe, Europe has a very strict uh, data protection rule set. So um, this is all protected on that side. And then after clicking register, you will get a email that will uh, let you confirm your registration. And after that, you can easily click the sign in button and I will just sign in with my user. A very new feature, as you can see from this banner, is actually our um, new portal version in French. So by clicking on the top right flag, you uh, translate the entire homepage to French. So if you are more familiar with French than with English, you can always do so. So what we're going for now is the sandbox. For that, you go on Build and then on Dunia Sandbox. You will see a brief um, explanation on what the Sandbox is and the different features. And then if you have logged in, you can click Launch Sandbox. Every new user gets a free Mahala 1X large machine. That's the name of the machine. And it consists of four CPU and 60 gigabytes of RAM and 50 gigabytes of object storage. Um, People from GMES Africa might have a, a different, will get a different premium account in case you're from GMES Africa consortiums, but um, this will be also changed in the future. So there might be more op, uh, possibilities to even expand your machine in case you want to have more CPU, in case you want GPU for training your models. So this will come later this year um, to get different uh, sets of resources. So if I click on, on Launch Sandbox, I will be redirected to the Sandbox. And you will basically just see the start page. Internet connection currently is not that strong. So let's wait here. So the, the start screen will show you some launchers. Uh, you can start with a Jupyter Notebook right away. Um, you can go for the desktop environment as well. You can start R, you can start a terminal and so on. On the left side, you see your file and folder system. So before we go into those, um, into Algal Bloom, I quickly want to show you uh, the desktop and, and the Python uh, notebook library. Uh, so by clicking desktop, you will be redirected to your own private uh, virtual machine uh, with a virtual desktop, you know, where you can use uh, the Snap software from ESA that has a lot of functionalities, uh, RStudio, but also if you go to applications, education, you see uh, two free uh, GIS software tools, GrassGIS and QGIS. So whatever, this is the same file system that you can see inside this uh, sandbox part here. And the Alga Bloom uh, example now is a Python um, notebook. And before we use that, um, everyone should use it, of course. So let's go to on, on 
our Dunia EZ .end homepage. We can click Discover and Wiki, and we will be redirected to our Wiki, uh, where we have all uh, the documentation. Not as much as I would like to have, but it's growing. On the left side, you see the menu of this documentation. So uh, under the build function, uh, build section, we want to go to Dunia Sandbox. And I will just quickly search for it because it will be faster. I will search example notebooks or example. And the third result brings me to this green button, get example notebooks. It's within the um, caption and be Git puller uh, content distributed to Jupyter users. Everyone can click that link and it will automatically redirect you to the sandbox and it will sync the files. And now you see you have access to the entire Dunia sandbox notebooks, the example notebooks. I will close this now because this is automatically done on my notebook as well. And I can see that because on the left side now, I see the direct directory dunia sandbox notebooks dot git. So this now automatically copied or synchronized this git repository with example notebooks to my personal sandbox environment. <coughs> By opening the directory, I see various um, categories, agriculture, atmosphere, floods, and so on. And algal bloom is within the water category. And if I click double blue, uh, double click on algal bloom, it will open up the Jupyter notebook for algal bloom. It has some images inside, so it might take a while. And as I said, my internet connection is currently not that Good, so let's see, here we go. And yeah, the remaining session now will be going through this um, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks are not just great for actually presenting um, like I will do now for you, but also in general for actually developing your own applications because you can jump from one cell to a prior one to um, another one and just you know do fixes in between. You can add some nice visualizations in between as you will now see in our example. And uh, it makes it really not, not just easy to develop but also fun to actually develop. So, but we want to focus now on how to access the satellite data uh, in the sandbox. So um, I will go on now. So we will take a look at the algal bloom at the western coast of South Africa. So why algal blooms? Why is it a, a, a topic? Um, it is actually um, a hazard that affects aquatic systems and is often resulting in uh, ecologic uh, and economic stress. So um, algal are um, depleting oxygen in the water and this leads to the death of all the, the marine ecosystems, the, the fish, uh, the corals and so on. And also this is then affecting the fisher, fishery industry. And again, also um, humans that are swimming in those waters are, can be affected and it can be harmful to them. So it's actually quite a hazard that we need to be aware of and that we actually want to monitor. What do I mean if I say monitor? Monitor means I want to check the current status of the water every day, right? And this can be done with satellite data because every, at least like every three days, we get a new image. Also, depending, of course, on the cloud coverage, um, but we will get new images and we can constantly see whether we have um, an increase in algal blooms, an increase in algal growth and, and can react and mitigate accordingly. So in this notebook, we will have four um, big chapters. First of all, we will access Sentinel-3 data. That's the satellite mission of our interest. It provides um, 
not just optical data, but also infrared data and is uh, very handy for algal bloom detection. Um, after that, we want to pre-process this data by um, doing some steps such as histogram normalization to uh, improve the contrast of the imagery and to actually see the small changes. And then as a next step, we um, actually, actually access the correct parts of the Sentinel-3 data sets that are actually of our interest and apply some algorithms to uh, create a um, chlorophyll concentration result. And finally, we want to, of course, create nice imagery uh, and do some visualization, uh, some plots at the end. So it will not look like this GIF, but it will look similar, you know, like just seeing how um, the West Coast, the Southwest Coast of Africa looks like from an optical point of view, and then how the algal blooms are um, growing and affecting the coast. Um, this should be quite familiar to everyone who uses Python. Um, in the beginning, you install your modules. In case it is not there, you can always do an inline install by using um, the um, exclamation mark in the beginning. So in this case, I install Cartopy in the beginning just to you know, have Cartopy. It's a tool for that helps us visualize data. Uh, if I execute it, it tells me I already did so. Uh, it's already existing, so that's fine. Um, besides some standard modules like NumPy, um, OS, Glob, and so on, you know, uh, we want to get some plotting modules for later, and we need some special modules like um, X-Array for working more efficiently with multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, as I said, Cartopy to um, that's not just good for for actually a plotting, but also for projections and reprojections, and so on. So, and maybe what's very important now for us is this part. It is called from UDAC import U data access gateway. This is the import we want to have for actually accessing our data sets. Um, recently, we had some issues with timeouts to get the data. So in the beginning, we will also set the UDAC uh, timeout to 120 seconds to avoid this issue. I'm not sure if it still persists, but uh, I want to go for sure. So as I said, we will take a look at Sentinel-3 data. There are actually two or various levels and different parts of Sentinel-3. Uh, three data. We want to take a look at OLCI data, level one and level two. What does it mean? It is level one is the, the full resolution data. It's the EFR and um, level two, we want to take a look at the water full resolution uh, with the abbreviation WFR. Those are the data sets we need. Uh, for more information, it's a similar notebook. And this is how I was actually creating this notebook is um, we used um, the example from your MATSAT from the Baltic Sea in 2023. That can be also found here if you're interested, but it's they're basically doing the same as we do here. Um, so let's access Sentinel-3 data. Now it's getting excited. You see a screenshot how we do so um, e very easily. Um, so on the left side here, we have this icon, UDAC. It is this uh, magnifier class on top of a globe. Um, if you click it, you will see this part. It's basically similar to here, right? And what we can do now is we can um, insert the provider then that we want to have, like Sentinel-3. Uh, let's see. Where did I do it so that I can copy it? Um, S3 EFR, for example. I don't know why it doesn't find it. It's the presentation modus. Ah, sorry, not provider, product type. Confused. So 
if I click S3 for Sentinel-3, I get EFR, ERR, LAN. So as I said, we have various ones, but uh, we are just interested in that one, for example. Then we can also provide a start date and an end date. So let's go for August 1st until August 6th. Um, and if I click generate code, let's do it up here because then I can delete it more easily. If I click generate code, it will underneath the cell I just marked, it will create a new cell with all the information that I need, with all the code that I need. So the import that I was talking to you about, the from UDAC import U data access gateway, it will set up some logging configuration. It will create the U data access gateway object, and then it will get the search results by searching for S3 EFR data for this particular time range. Of course, I also want to have um, a, spe a specific region. So uh, I go down to the area I'm interested in, the Western Cape. Uh, I just, sorry, delete that one. We'll just create this now. Again, I will create generate code. And you see it will even uh, create the geometry I drew and add it to the query, the data query, right? And I, if I'm interested, I can even click preview your results and you see all the footprints and, and you can actually see the data. But we will ignore that for now because we did do that with our code. So most of the code that you see now and in this section of Access Sentinel-3 data is basically the result of using this feature here that is way more easy because I don't have to, you know, get the numbers of my of my area of interest. Um, and I see, I know the different product types that are available and so on. So that's basically what we did now. We have the object, we create the geometry. This is just a function to actually um, get the thumbnails to get the, um, to display some imagery because I want to see the results now. So just ignore it for now. Um, here I explain a bit um, the, um, that we have different timelinesses in Sentinel-3. There is near real time, NRT, and there is non-time critical, NTC. Because if I do this search for data now, I would get NRT data and NTC data for the same dates. And it just means that um, near real time data is really the data right after, right three after three hours after the data acquisition and non-time critical means they added some more metadata and, and ancillary data afterwards so for us as we just do this um not really with current data but with past data we can go for ntc because it doesn't matter um so here i can just insert the timeliness and I can also include the timeliness then in my search query because I don't want to get every Sentinel-3 data twice, you know, which is basically the same, just having more metadata that uh, just removes some, some overhead. So if I execute this, um, I get the search results. Those are a list of objects as you will shortly see, and I will get a total count, of course, um, meaning I have 79 images that were found between the 1st of February, 2022 and the 28th of February, 2022. Um, so requesting data is is using actually an API and most API is you are using paging algorithms, you know, you, um, on the first page, you see 20 results. You need to click on the next page to see the next 20 results. That's, you know, think of an, a home page where you see a list of things and you can click to the next page and to the next page. That's the same with API usages. So uh, we can get the pages by um, 
dividing the total count by 20 because each page has 20 results and we know we have four pages. So to get all the search results, because those search results will now be 20 results, but we want to have all the 79 results. So for that, we loop through all the four pages and then I will just um, create the same search as we did before, just by providing the page number. And then I add it to my original search results. And finally, we get all the 79 S3 EFR images for that area of interest and between the start date and the end date. And as I said, I created this small function display images that is going into the structure of those search results. It will get the thumbnail, which is basically the image, the uh, overview image to get a, a, a fast overview of the cloud coverage and so on. And uh, yeah, I will then do some plotting to get this result and, and show this result. And, and you can see it here now, like we see the different dates and the different coverages. Of course, my then you, you can easily see my area of interest was probably too big. I see some images in somewhere not of the, that's not the West Coast, right? Um, here it's West Coast, but probably the more interesting part is here. Here we're just on top of the ocean with a lot of clouds and so on. So we use this to actually analyze the data. I want to check out the thumbnails to get the data that I actually want. Right. So I see, wow, this one is pretty nice, right? This is 4th of February. I see the entire coastline without clouds. The clouds are just coming more in inside the, the sea, the ocean. And yeah, this part actually doesn't matter. But what I want to have is nicely uh, covered and so on. So I, I remember those dates and, and time frames that I actually want to have. So I scroll down, those are all the results. And I can do the same thing, not just for EFR data, but also for level WFR data. That's the water content. Um, so I, it's gonna be the same the same dates and the same images, but it's always nice, nice to actually, you know, look at your data before you start working on it. Um, the, the land masses are brown. Um, and the water masses have different colors, like a blue scheme up to um, yellowish schemes. And those are, uh, can be sediments and algal uh, and algal, yeah. So I see this is a pretty nice picture. And of course, this is one as well, yeah. So you go on and, and check your data and you do first analysis. And then I define my dates of interest that I actually have. For me, I was I was happy with three images. That was fine for me for for, for this uh, example. So I chose um, 11th of February, 18th of February, and 22nd of February. I just want to have the overall you know um, evolution and 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 movement of the algal bloom because it uh, it is moving um, with the currents and the streams that you have in um, Saint Helena Bay. I think I mentioned the name of this current, but I'm not 100% sure if I can find it. I don't remember it, but I somehow wrote the name of the current here as well. So let's filter those three time steps. You know, I just go into those search results. I check for the completion time from ascending node inside the properties of those results. And if they align with my dates of interest, I will just append them to my EFR path and WFR path of, of interest. Now we selected the data that we actually wanted to have, um, but that's not all because those data sets are NetCDF data and the NetCDF data is, um, it is a complexity itself. Um, it's basically like a folder structure within a file. So within one file, within one NetCDF file, you have various bands and various results, various different information. 
Um, and this is what I just sorted out here. For our approach, we need these bands from EFR and these bands from WFR. You see, we have all the different bands, different reflectance values and different other metadata like this WQSF information or the coordinates that we want to extract from the NetCDF file. So in this, those two um, cells, we're actually, you know, requesting those paths. Um, in those NetCDF files, uh, we just go to those paths and we can join those um, radians and C files. So those are NetCDF files within that EFR folder structure. So we are creating the overall final um, yeah, path that we want to access. So let's go here. Here you see the keys again. So you have the various dates, the, the dates of interest, the 11th, the 18th, and the 22nd. And we have the Sentinel-3 data that we actually want to have. Here I do a final check whether really all paths actually exist that I want to have, and they seem to be completely available. So now that we got the data, that's the first step, we need to read the data. And as I said, NetCDF data is a bit more special, but X-Array is a great tool to actually get uh, a nice uh, overview of, of NetCDF data. So by using the open MF dataset functionality of X-Array, um, we can open all the data sets of our level one and level two um, Sentinel-3 data sets. And you can see how they, they look like. Those are the paths, the files. And if you take a look at one of those data sets, you can get all of that information. You see the dimension, like how many rows and columns you have. So in, in, in total, how many pixels you have you get some information on the data variables. As I said, the various um, radiances as well. And yeah, we see that that each NetCDF file um, is stored as a new uh, NetCDF variable, basically. So that's, that's how we want to read the data, right? So we open the data sets in this list and um, then we go through the values and you know just just filter them. Um, the thing is that the boundaries were still too big, as I said. So I created some uh, area of interest bounds, and I needed them to make a better, um, you know, to just do our calculations on on St. Helena Bay itself. So it needs to be smaller. So those values were just, you know, figured out by myself uh, to get the smaller St. Helena Bay and not the entire coast. Because in the beginning, I was like interested where on the entire West Coast do I find um, the algal bloom? And as soon as I saw I ah, they're close to St. Helena Bay, I decided, you know, to crop the data now to uh, the smaller area of interest of St. Helena Bay. So I just defined it this area of interest. You can of use, again, use the UDAC functionality just to get you um, the, the geometry. And then I was clipping the data to this, um, to this AOI. And for, for clipping it, I um, created two functions, uh, the point distance and the subset image. The point distance is a function to calculate uh, the distance between uh, latitude, longitude points, and the subset image is then finally, you know, cro cropping the image. So I will not go too much into detail for that. So we just use those functionalities and create the subsets. Um, exactly. Those are how we create the subsets. And now we do the pre-processing. Well, now we have read the data, the various NetCDF files with X array and crop them to our area of interest. And now we do the pre-processing. So what are the pre-processing steps? Uh, in the beginning, we want to normalize the image. Um, 
what does it mean? Um, if you think of an histogram of an image, let's say you have an image, and this image can have values from zero to 100, but all the values within that image are between 10 and 20. So you can't really see differences. So you want to actually stretch the values to the entire value range to actually see the contrasts and to uh, eliminate outliers. This is why we do um, a histogram normalization, or the, in this case, the, the image normalization. Um, so we do that. You can use this uh, this function. If you're interested, you can read the, you know, the, the function um, documentation and then dive into that. I think we don't have too much time to, to dive into the details of each function. Um, then we truncate the image. So we remove outliers um, and, and no data values. Uh, so we use percentiles to, you know, just crop away um, the, um, values that we don't want to have. And finally, uh, we do the histogram and equalize it. So that those three functions are basically the histogram normalization. The, we normalize it, we remove outliers, and we do then the histogram of this new data. And you will see that the results are, you know, pretty much more beautiful because you have um, a better contrast. And you can see that when we plot the true color images of those normalized uh, images. So we see we just are we're focusing on the St. Helena Bay. That was because we did not just read the data, but also cropped it. And um, due to the uh, pre-processing, we also see that we can really see a lot of details um, within the images, also within the C here. And we can already assume where the algal bloom are, are happening. So let's go to the main part of the algal bloom detection. And we do that with four steps. First, we create masks that are based on this WQSF layer that is part of the Sentinel-3 data. So you will find it within the, the data sets. We just also read it, if you can remember. Those are basically saying, where do you have um, maybe uh, um, corrupt pixels? Where do you have cloud pixels um, and so on? It's just like a basic classification layer to, to help you masking out um, pixels or areas that you are not interested in and that are you know, distracting, such as clouds. And, and you apply this mask then on our uh, main two layers that we get from Sentinel-3, the chlorophyll OC4ME and the chlorophyll NN. Um, and then using those two masks, we will calculate the MPH, which is the chlorophyll concentration. So all three can be then used for analyzing uh, the algal bloom. But um, the only algorithm we do ourselves is the MPH, while the other ones are actually part already part of Sentinel-3. And then in the end, we will visu visualize those three results. So this is in the first step when, when masking, this is just a simple uh, flag mask function that is reading the array and removing particular um, areas like uh, zeros and 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 you know just particular values of the um, WQSF result, and and here you can see how we flag it. Um, first, you define the flags like I don't want to have land, I don't want to have cloud. Why do we not want to have land? Because we're interested about the sea, right? So we don't need land, we don't need cloud, we don't need uh, invalid or saturated data, and so on. So those are uh, recommended flags to use. I comment them out because they actually remove too much of my data. Everything was just blank. So you always have to use it as you see it coming. You know, you need to visualize the results and then you need to play uh, with those flags and those masks, of course. Um, in my, um, in this example, using those masks destroyed and removed more information uh, than I actually want to have. So, you know, I just use the flag mask. Um, I use the, the file, 
the OC4ME flags are empty now. So I actually do not mask anything, but if I would use the recommended flags, they would be this list of strings. And then it's basically accessing this file, going for the WQSF layer and using those masks to remove uh, those areas and tra transform them to no data values, right? And the same can be then done for the NN data. Um, this product is basically for complex waters. Um, and N means neural network. So there was um, they created a neural network for actually, you know, processing um, or modeling complex waters and getting um, the chlorophyll content based on uh, on that network. While here I have the explanations here as well. While OC4ME is more um, uh, baseline. How do you say? Um, you know, it is it is basically the the main uh, chlorophyll content information of uh, Sentinel three data. So uh, we flag both of those results, and then we calculate our MPH chlorophyll. It's the maximum peak height chlorophyll concentration. Um, and I don't know whether I think I mentioned the source of this. If you if you search for it, you find easily the paper for that chlorophyll concentration as well. So it measures the amount of chlorophyll A, um, basically the main chlorophyll pigment in inside algae, um, and especially also an indicator for the algal bloom and the water quality. So as the the higher the chlorophyll levels, uh, the the bigger and more serious the algal bloom, of course. So the MPH calculation is accessing particular wavelengths. And after stacking the data, it is choosing those wavelengths and then doing this main calculation here. Yeah. Which is basically an indicator, uh, which is you know subtracting and multiplying various wavelength information with each other. And some constants probably also from, from uh, calculated from models. Again, we will mask that data to remove um, unwanted areas. And then we clip it again to a smaller region of interest. Um, and then finally, we can uh, visualize our algal bloom. Um, any, everyone who's not familiar with it, so in the beginning of matplotlib, you create a, a subplot. You can create the amount of images you want to have beside each other and underneath each other. And here I just, you know, have nine images. They are currently not showing. Um, and I want to see the OC4ME, um, the neural network information, and the MPH information. So I want to see all the results, all three um, chlorophyll information for my area of interest for all the three data sets. So this is OCME for basically the 11th of February, the 18th of February, and then it would be, you know, the 22nd of February. Uh, I don't know why it's not showing now. The same goes for the neural network uh, information and also the MPH information. So you see the, re the, the evolution of the algal or the chlorophyll content within the water uh, with using by using three different products. And you see also the, the legend here. I also went for a different visualis uh, visualization because I liked it more. And that by that, I, I just plotted the result on top of the true color image to actually see where on the coast we have the chlorophyll contents. You see mm, the masks we're removing quite a lot um, of the data. So you can't actually really see the main chlorophyll content. In this case, it's true because you see a lot of weird um, cloudy data, but um, MPM, the, NN, the NN was actually quite good in, in showcasing the results and also the um, MPH. I think I have better results here. I don't know why it shows. Yeah, I need to 
let's go for the Dunia Sandbox results. If you check out the repository itself, um, the results are stored. So I might as well look at the stored results. Sometimes the data is not displayed correctly and then you might execute the same uh, notebook again to actually see the evolution uh, within. Finally, just to say it at the end, I created a GIF um, that I was also publishing on LinkedIn where you see um, the temporal evolution of the algal bloom. Um, yeah, uh, let's quickly dive to that one. In So this is the Dunia Sandbox example notebooks collection that we synchronized. Um, you can That's publicly available. So you can also go directly to this uh, repository and you can check out the Python notebooks because uh, Bitbucket offers a Python notebook viewer. It is really not fast in loading, so it will take a minute or two to actually just load the, the notebook. But as soon as this is done, um, I can quickly show you how the results would actually look like. Um, this was basically, I think, maybe done uh, with more flags involved, but yeah. This is basically, uh, the notebook and while we are waiting for um, the real results to show um, yeah ah here we go so it's basically doing the same as we did and you see the the results down here ah it doesn't either okay never mind never mind if you if you execute it you should see it but you know you should get results like that uh, where you can actually see how the algal, uh, the chlorophyll content, where the chlorophyll content is the highest along the coast, and comparing it uh, to the different time frames, you see how this um, chlorophyll content is um, moving towards the north together with uh, the current you have at the St. Helena Bay and the entire west coast. Great. So that's it from my side. Um, I see there are some questions. Um, here, I see one good one. Uh, what if I wanna do this for multiple regions? Will the code generate multiple sections for each region? Um, so if I wanna do this for multiple regions, I think the easiest is just go region by region. Uh, this is for actually for developing, not for processing. So if I want to process for various reasons after I'm happy with my application, then I would actually um, recommend the application hub. You know, you have your own application and then you can just run it for several regions. For developing, if you want to check out whether this is also, you know, works for other regions, I would just go to the top of the notebook and change the geometry, the area of interest, and then everything should be similar. Um, of course, you need to also change the dates of interest because in this case, algal blooms, they're not everywhere in the world at the same time. But yeah, you know, you know just ad, um, adapt the geometry and uh, the times and by checking out the results and you, you will be fine. That's basically what I did using this example notebook from UMATSAT for Baltic Sea. I added some more um, documentation and explanation uh, in between, also for non-EO users or non maybe Python users as well. So um, hopefully this helps. Um, you get warning. Uh, Zero or four nodes are available, insufficient CPU. Um, didn't match pods node. We will take a look into that, Joshua. It might be that currently, if we have a lot of people accessing the same infrastructure, we actually looked at it and wanted to, you know, uh, it should, should work out, but uh, we will contact our partners who are in charge of that to see whether uh, maybe the resources were not correctly allocated for that, but uh, we will make sure Joshua to to um, 
uh, check this error and we will come back to you. Great. Any any other questions? You're also welcome to um, you know to just um, unmute and and talk. Right. So um, if anybody has a question, you can just raise your hand so that we can um, have you on mute. But um, yeah, um, Johannes, we have some other questions from other attendees and someone would like to know what potential products, services and business models that the Dunia platform can support. Uh, could you recommend uh, could could you repeat that question please right so somebody wants to know what potential product services and business models that um the junior capabilities can support okay so i see that there are somehow two different questions i think because um of course services and 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 products so products for me whatever you want to process using Dunia, uh, if we have the data that you need, uh, then you can use Dunia. Um, if you want to, if you think about um, integrating Dunia with your own platforms or with your own services, of course, we would need to uh, look into that in particular. So we are quite free in actually, you know, uh, adapting Dunia and, and, and helping people with um, using particular services. So, um, by not using Dunia, you can always use um, our streaming um, separately or our data access separately. So you can actually access all the data outside of Dunia using your Dunia account as well, in case you are more interested in, you know, just use Dunia for the data access. Um, about the, the overall, um, what was it, the, um, the model, the... Um, could you repeat that last word, please? Um, the business model, sorry. Um, yeah, the business model. So the main uh, objective of ESA here was to have more people use Copernicus Sentinel data. It's free data and uh, not many people in Africa are using it. And so they just want to increase the usage of the data that they actually provide for free. That's why they wanted to have Dunia and also offering that for experts and beginners. That was the main objective of ESA. Of course, um, Dunia wants to live on after that project is over. So what we're trying to do is create a billing system uh, which people can use to buy more resources. So in case people are interested in, in machine learning uh, modeling, um, of course, most people want to have GPU. GPU are very expensive. So we cannot offer free resources, especially GPU, to everyone in Africa. That, that's uh, crazy, of course. So our billing uh, model would be, or our billing system would include the opportunity for people to um, go beyond this free resources and buy more more storage, more CPU, more GPU. And this, of course, costs money and will uh, provide revenue for ourselves. That is the main business model behind it. Um, yeah. But in, in, in the beginning, it is basically a project that is funded by ESA. That's how it started. Yeah. So currently, it's for free. It's for free to register. It is for free to uh, get data. And also in the future, it will be for free to register and for free to actually access data just uh, um, your own working environment that is actually on and, and on an infrastructure that of course uh, will then cost in in some future uh, if you want to have more than the free resources available yeah I hope this answers your question I believe it does thank you very much um Another participant would like to confirm um, the process of uploading and um, downloading um, satellite imagery onto the Dunia platform. So, yes, I, I can go dive right into that. So if I'm here at my um, 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 notebook, I can do a right click and I can do click download and it will download the data. 
and not just the notebook, but any kind of, of data set that I'm going to create. My personal 50 gigabytes of storage are stored in a S3 bucket that is backupped. So if you go to the file sharing repo, this is this star on our desktop environment. You can store or you need to store all your data in here because if you just store it within your uh, yeah, within your uh, Jupyter Notebook, it will then be deleted at some point when you log out. But if you want to keep that your results, you need to upload it to your own, you know, file sharing repository. This is also how you can reuse that data in our application hub or in the marketplace. So this is all the data that I stored. Um, I can always download this data. Um, then it's downloaded to the machine itself, to the to the um, working environment, and I can also download it in general by again accessing the Jupyter Notebook. Let me quickly open the sandbox. I closed it. So yeah, as I said, I I think I already showed it. I can easily click download and I download it. So as a first step, you know, you first need to download your data from your file sharing repository in case you permanently saved it and then you go to your uh, notebook and download it completely to your desktop and you can also do an upload you see the upload button here you click upload and it's currently loading um yeah and i can easily upload uh any data set um you know and it will upload the data here and I can work with it. And nobody except for you will see your uploaded data. That's very important because many people I think didn't understand that. Whatever you upload here is only visible to yourself. It doesn't matter if it's this working environment or if you wanna keep it permanently and you store it here in your file sharing repository, it is only kept by yourself and only visible to yourself. It is protected. Nobody can else can access it. So you can also use, you know, your secret information, your secret data sets. Nobody are, is allowed to see whatever. We have no opportunity to do so as well. All right. Thank you very much, um, Johannes. Um, this has been very exhaustive. Um, if you have any more questions or any um, information that you would like to get regarding the Dunia platform, regarding the example notebooks and uh -huh. any other uh, applications that you want to you know, create through the uh -huh. Dunia platform, please don't hesitate to reach out to um, UNS on LinkedIn or Yan as well. They are available and they are ready to answer your questions. Um, if you are already using the Dunia platform for applications, we'd like to hear more about um, the programs and applications that you have been able to create with the platform. Um, you can send us an email. You can send an email to um, info at spaceinafrica.com. Um, this is going to inform some of um, a series of articles that we're going to be writing regarding the Dunia platform. Um, you can also send an email to Ayolua, that is A-Y-O-O-L-U-W-A at spaceinafrica.com. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are going to have um, other webinars in the coming weeks. We hope you stay tuned to the Space in Africa um, social media platforms to get more information about other webinars that you'd be interested in. Um, Jan and um, Johannes, is there any other thing you would like to mention before we end the webinar? Uh, no, just maybe in case you um, you view this uh, image, uh, this, this video, not live, but uh, afterwards, because we recorded this session. I think it says Jan Streitenberger underneath my face, but uh, my name is Johannes Schmidt. I'm just using his uh, his login link um, to this meeting. So yeah, feel free to reach out. Um, if you go to the bottom of our homepage, there is a support button. Whenever you have issues, please don't hesitate and write us. Um, we will usually answer within uh, a working day and answer all your questions. In case there are um, issues, we will um, have them as highest priority and, and fix them as, as soon as we can. So 
feel free to reach out. Also, if you need help and have questions, if something is not easy to understand, please uh, never hesitate to use the support button and, and create a ticket.